Hello everybody, welcome, hope you're all well. Um, glad to be here joining you and uh, let's see, there are a few folks, a few folks in watching, good, that's good. Right, uh, another read work um, workshop and uh, this time I want to focus on just three procedures with harmonicas, voicing, valving, and tuning. And voicing is a, is a term that uh, is used in organ builders for when they, when they adjust the pipes, both the flue pipes and the reed pipes uh, to, make, to, to improve the sound, to make them speak properly and get the kind of tone that they're looking for. And with the reed pipes, most reed pipes and organs are beating reeds. In other words, they're not free reeds like the harmonica reeds. They, um, they uh, beat against what's called a shallot, it's kind of a little a frame. Then, and uh, the, one of the key aspects of voicing is to, is to adjust the curvature of the reed so that it doesn't slam down all at once on the, on the shallot, but it kind of curls down and, uh, and, and the amount of curl and the type of, type of curvature they put in it can control the voice. Um, and also voicing refers to all the other things that's done with the pipes, like what type of resonators they put on it. So I suppose with harmonicas, voicing would also include um, any, any other adjustments you do to the reed or to the reed chamber. Uh, if you want to like change the shape of the reed chamber or the covers or anything like that, it could be considered voicing. But, but for the purposes of, of here, I'm I'm using it to describe the curvature and the offset and manipulation of the reed itself. So, without any further ado, let me move the camera down here. Get set up. Okay, so this reed plate here is um, straight from the factory. It's had no modifications done to it whatsoever except uh, riveting the reed on and, and setting the offset and, and the factory gave it a tuning. But other than that, there's been no, I've done no modification to it at all. And the, uh, the first thing we're going to do is to lower the back of the reed down into the slot. And now if you look, if you look, let's see here. There you go. You can see the light coming through the slot there. And when the reed closes, most, most factory adjusted reeds, there'll still be a little bit of light showing back at the ribbon end. And that's what we want to get down. Uh, I'll show you the tool that I used to do it with. Kind of a burnishing tool. And it's, where are we? Here we go. Looks like a chisel, but I've put a, a little radius where there wouldn't normally be an edge, a little polished radius there that I can use to to rub against the reed and lower it in. Now, the one way that uh, the, the way I like to do it is I'll put a slip or a shim under here, and how far in how far in you move the slip from here to there as you push down will actually adjust the offset. Which we'll work on later, but but as you're as you're lowering the reed in, you can check and see how it's affecting the offset, and if it's if it's lowering it 
too far as you're pushing that down, then you can just move the slip in a little closer. And that will that'll actually raise the reed as you're pushing it down. And likewise, if it's raising the offset too much, you just pull it back a little bit. So we'll start somewhere around here. And I'm just going to... Oh, the other thing I, I like to do is uh, wear a second pair of reading glasses over my bifocals just to improve the sight. My eyes are dim. I cannot see. I have not brought my specs with me. So, oh, Boy Scout song. Okay. Now, so I'll take just about about uh, about two millimeters or so back, and just sort of rub it in. Now, you you kind of don't want to mess with reeds any more than necessary. Even this is not really the best thing to do for reeds. But it, it uh, if you're careful and, and not too not too uh, use too much pressure, then it's not going to do much damage, and you really need to get that reed down in. So, pushing it down like that, checking my offset, and that's raising the offset a little bit. Can you see, where am I? That's the third one from the end. See, it's a little bit high, so I'll move this back out a little more. And continue on. Back out a little more. This is actually polishing the reed a little bit as well. Uh, I'm not really into polishing reeds all that much. I, I don't think it has much to do with um, the tone. Uh, I know that, uh, that the uh, the Gola accordions, which were Honer's most expensive accordions years back, they polished the reeds, but they determined that it was it made little difference in longevity or tone, but it was just once again unnecessarily messing with reeds, so they don't normally do it, but right back here, there's no harm in putting a bit of a polish back here because this is always the place where a reed will fail. And they do tend to fail along those milling marks, all right. I know back when they were studying the the uh, filing marks, people were worried that the <clears throat> type of, when the reeds would be filed on the back, that those filing marks were actually damaging the reed, but but in, in tests they did, it was rarely, reeds would rarely fail on these filing marks unless it was really badly filed and a deep groove put in it. Normally the reed, when it fails, it fails along one of these milling marks. So there's there's no harm to kind of polish a bit right back there all right. So where, where are we now? Take that down a little more. Still in camera, yeah. That's pretty good. And if, if you look at it now, uh, you can see there's the third, third reed there. How the back there is closed up a lot more. Um, and the offset is actually. right about where it was when we started. I can raise it just a little bit. So that's the first step, getting it down back there. And the next step is, is adjusting your curvature. Now the what you want to have is when the reed closes, you'd like to have the 
entire read, closing off the slot all at one time because um, once again, if you get a, a real clean definition of of um, the air pulses, then uh, as as the as the air is is stopped, blocked, and then reopened as the read is in the slot, the the sharper you get of that uh, uh, of that pulse of air, then the the more more efficient the sound is, um, and it's actually it's actually a little bit like uh, the difference between a a reed that has too much curvature so that it's not closing at once and a reed that is has a has a curvature that does close it off at once sounds a little bit like in, in tone a little bit like the difference between a sine wave and a square wave and I, I have a recording here just to let you hear just for interest's sake uh, where is it now if of uh, the sound of a sine wave and the sound of a square wave. Square wave. Let me see where is it. I should have cued it up. Okay. Now the the uh, first sound you're going to hear is the sound of a sine wave. And the sine wave uh, is kind of your classic wave sound, but it's sort of a gentle wave wave pattern where, um, and you get a kind of a smooth sound. That sounds like this. Coming up, sounds like. Right, very smooth. And the next one is a square wave, where uh, there's, and the, the, the wave actually looks like little squares going up and down, where you have like zero amplitude to maximum amplitude, just like we're looking for in a harmonica, where there's no sound and then full sound. And you get that, that edge to the sound, which is kind of characteristic of a, of a harp that's set up nicely. That sounds like this. Right, so that's that's kind of, uh, and it's, I, I fancy, I could be wrong, but I fancy that that's similar to what we're looking for in the harmonica. The uh, a harmonica that's, that's got a good, uh, good tolerance, either from the factory or from embossing, that might have a chamfered uh, reeds and a good offset, is going to have that kind of a buzz to it. And that, that that allows the reed to speak a lot more, a little more rich in the upper partials and harmonics. So that's that first part. Next part is the curvature, um, and the way we can do it. You can look at the reed and look at how it's closing. Let's see. And it seems like. The tip might be closing a little bit before the other, so I'm just going to put, I'm just going to put a little curvature here. And the way I do that is keep the finger on the press down on the rivet pad and just in front of the rivet pad, because you don't want to bend it up back at the at the back there. Number one, we've just lowered it down there. You don't want to raise it again, and also um, you don't want to stress that area because that's kind of a a area of of high. Uh, um, where there's tension goes on there. So I'm just going to raise the reed up a little bit like that. Bit of a curvature. And now the offset's a little high, so I'll be lowering it down. And I do that with the, just with my fingernail. Now what I like to do is I like to look at the at the edge here, and I, I don't want to see that reed dip too far down into the slot. You should see a, a fairly consistent amount of 
of of the top edge of the wreath sticking up just above the slot there. And that is already down as far as I want to go. The offset is a little too high, so the curvature is a little too much. So the way I like to flatten the curvature is rest the finger like that, and then with this tool here, just rub it against my finger like that. And that'll, that'll flatten that curve a bit. Now, give it a few plucks. Okay, let's hear it. Now, the the read to slot tolerance on this is is not remarkable. It's not the best. It's not the worst. It's sort of middle of the road, but. and is speaking with pretty low pressure as well. So that's good. That's the first part. Um, you're lowering it at the back, getting your curvature right, and setting your offset. Now, as to how much offset you want, that depends on your, your style of playing. And uh, what, I, what I like to say sometimes is, when you're setting your offset, test the offset at the loudest that you normally play. And if the reed starts to choke, then you can raise the offset a little more. And, and what you can try doing is start lowering the offset until it starts to choke. And you'll get an idea of where your what's a suitable offset for you. Um, so... There's that. I think that part is done. Any questions? Let me see. Comments. Where are the comments? Comments. Okay. Um. Oh, um. Uh, there was a question someone asked about. Will uh the setting of a reed, the curvature and the offset of the reed, in normal playing, will it change? And in my experience, no. It's not a kind of a thing that, that you have to periodically redo to your reeds. Normally, uh, once you set the, the curvature and the offset, it, it stays pretty well. So um, that's, that's that bit there. So the next step in here, let's see, no, no questions, I think we're good. Right, so valving is the next. Now, uh, the way I would uh, set a valve on is first I would tension the valve. Here's here's a valve here. Okay, and I like to put a little bit of a tension right back here. I, I hold it with the tweezers right about where the glue ends, well, the glues the two layers together. <clears throat> and just put a little bit of a, a little bit, where are we, a little bit of a tension there. You can see that, just a little bit. See that there? And uh, the other thing that I like to do <clears throat> is a trick I learned from uh, Dalio Gabinelli, was uh, an accordion technician I used to work with in New York. And uh, he, in, when he would be installing uh, leather accordion valves and the Italian style leather accordion valves, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> Italian style leather accordion valves have have leather for the bottom layer, but for the top layer where we have this extra piece of plastic, they uh, they have a little thin, narrow piece of uh, 
shim or a little spring wire, flat spring wire. Uh, they call it contrapelle, is the Italian for it. And normally, when they would when they would be put on the the uh, the contrapelle, the wire would go up just about the same distance that you would see at, on these harmonica valves. Let's see here. Now you can see. You can see, you can see how the top layer goes to within about a little less than two millimeters, like that. So what Dalio would do, he would actually shorten the wire, contrapelle, down to about, let me get some scissors here. Down to about this now, and you can see I've taken a good ways back. And oh, the reason he does this is that this it helps the reed to speak better at low volume. When you're playing really lightly, it's easier for the very tip of the reed uh, valve open up and allow the reed to speak at low volume and what he would do to compensate for having shortened the top layer or the, or the wire is he would put a, a little curvature a little bow in that wire to increase the tension of the wire and uh, I'll show you how uh, I do that you can do it you can actually do it with tweezers just like this you know like you Pull it out like that, but there's a, another method that I'll show you in a minute that's kind of handy. So, the cement that I use is the cement that we used to use in in the states at the in the harmonica department at Honer was plyo bond, uh, a kind of a contact cement, and uh, worked really good. We actually sent samples of it to the factory because we found that it it held better than the the, the cement that the factory was using, and they tested it and said, yeah, it does it does hold better, but the only problem with the plyobond was that it kind of uh, would make strings, you know, like little little strings of glue when they would be touching the uh, the reed to the glue. It was just a little too messy for them to be working with in 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 the factory situation. So, but we used it all the time, the plyobond, and this is the closest that I found here. This is. Uh, Evo stick, multi-purpose impact, instant contact adhesive. Where is it? There you go. I find this works works pretty good. And the way I will do it, I'll show you. <coughs> is take the. just squeeze enough just to get a little bit of glue up at the top there a little bit like that and then touch it to it and then if there's any excess you see that there's there's your strings again uh, but this with the rate that we work at it's not a problem so a little bit more there and then any excess you can wipe off down there And then just set it on like that, adjust it so that it's just beyond the just beyond the uh, front edge of the reed slot. Now there's another thing you can do when you're when you're valving, say, a chromatic, and you don't have a lot of room inside. Uh, uh, you tend to cheat the inside valve. In other words move it a little bit more in towards the, the one side to get it away from the side wall and just make sure that you don't expose the, the reed slot but just just cheat it a little bit to one side and that gives you a little extra clearance uh, inside the uh, and the inside valve so the reed uh, valve doesn't touch those the cell walls okay um, 
So that's that's your valving. Um, uh, when uh, I when I'm cleaning my harmonicas, because I, I play a lot of valved octave harmonicas, um, uh, I find a, a handy way to to clean it <clears throat> is is uh, just to remove the the reed plates and put them in a ultrasonic cleaner, one of these little things you can put your eyeglasses and, and uh, jewelry into, and uh, they're cheap enough. I think I got it for like 25 euros at the local uh, Aldi store. Um, uh, and uh, I've set it in the bath with just warm water, not too hot water, just a couple of drops of washing up liquid. And then I will, uh, when it's in the water, I'll just briefly raise the top layer raise raise the top layer and then the bottom layer just to get the water in there and run it through it's, it's about a four or five minute cycle and that tends to clean all the junk off from inside the valve and underneath the valve and then i just uh, tap it dry and, and, and set it in a warm spot to let it dry and that does a good job of of uh, keeping them clean and they'll last a long time that way uh, so there's one other thing about valves is that the outside valves tend to curl over time like this you can see that they're that they're setting up they're sitting up from the like that and you want them to be lying flat to work best and what we used to do at, at Horner was just take a little bit of a wire and set it in between the uh, between the layers, kind of like, like, like that, kind of, you know, and then just push down on it, uh, and that would tension the up, upper layer, but it would also put a little bit of a kink in the bottom layer, and what you really want to do is keep that thing nice and flat. <clears throat> so, I came up with a, a little tool that uh, works the same way as the wire, but it's flat on the bottom and it looks it looks like this okay you see there's a little ridge on that side and then it's and then on this side where are we here we are then on this side it is flat you see that flat and then ridged like that so what I'll do is just set it in, like, say this one here, just sitting up, set it in between the layers. This one has the top layer going all the way to the end. There we go. Just set it in as far as it'll go without, without pushing up the upper layer too much. You'll see that. And then rest the finger on it like that and pull it straight back. And that sets it nice and flat. I'll do it again so on, on this one here. Put it in like that. Hold it on and pull it straight back. And this is actually in a way, with the wire, you're only putting pressure or only putting tensioning the top valve just at the one spot, whereas this one, it actually tensions it all the way like that. Um, so that's how that works. Now, with some of the, the new type valves, these valves are the old style Horner valves, but with the new ones, there's that textured bottom layer, they... Uh, uh, are more delicate than the old than the old ones and so I find it helps to just put an extra shim underneath to protect that bottom layer and then put this in like that and you can pull it back like this and that keeps the bottom layer nice and flat so I have a couple of uh, um, 
harp technicians asked would I make these to to sell. So I started I started making them, and uh, um, Richard Slay and Joel Anderson both have them in stock. So I'll add a, a links to the comments after this is over. Um, if you anyone want to try them out, there's another little uh, video showing how it's worked on their websites as well. So that is pretty much it for the valving. There's one other thing that Dalio did, which is I don't think really necessary for these. He would put a little on the upper layer. He would put a little little ski tip, pull it up just a little bit, and uh, that helped prevent the top layer from catching on the bottom layer as it opened. I don't really think it's necessary for these because this is pretty smooth. Whereas in on those valves, they're um, steel wire against leather and there's more chances of it hanging up so that's what he did anyway with that and i don't think it's really necessary with this but i do like i do like shortening the top layer and then tensioning the bottom i mean shortening the top layer and tensioning it a little more just to uh, uh, allow you to uh, get a little better response at low volume so that is valving and Next bit is the tuning. So I'll show you the tools that I use. <clears throat> There's files and scrapers and lifters and shims and supports. Uh, file. There's all kinds of good files that you can get these days. Uh, this is the kind that uh, they use at the factory. It's a, a warding file, a little Swiss warding file. And I'll use this for raising the pitch of reeds, of all the reeds, except for maybe the very highest reeds where you want to be careful about um, filing because you can actually catch the tip of the reed, catch the tip of the reed and, and, and bend it. So I'll show you um, on tuning the high reeds a little bit later. So there's, there's this method here, there's this uh, tool here for um, for tuning the low reeds, and it's just as you can imagine, just like just like this. Um, and when I'm when I'm filing, I like to. Uh, the last time we talked about in reed chamfering, that uh, the the best of the handmade accordion reeds all, all have a bit of a radius on the top. They're kind of there's thinner at the sides and and thickest in the middle, a little bit of a dome, and it's that it's that it's that thinner edge that, that gives you um, more volume and better response. So especially here when I'm filing, I tend to kind of if it if it's not been chamfered, I will I will sort of work it a little bit side to side so that uh, you can you can kind of start doing a bit of chamfering with the reed while you're while you're filing um, and and the uh, when you're when if if it's just fine tuning you can pretty much just stay with the end here but if you're doing a lot of uh, like retuning it all together you probably want to distribute where you're removing metal from, from along the reed. Um, and most reeds that are that have little or no val uh, weights on them, you have a point that's about one third from the tip to towards the rivet right there is where you're, you're kind of your, your pitch neutral area, where if you remove metal from here, that raises the pitch. And if you remove it from anywhere along here, that lowers the pitch. So, uh, but normally when you're just fine tuning, you're only working on the end here. For lowering the pitch, uh, I like to use a, a reed scratcher. Uh, this is one that the accordion technicians use. Looks like this. Um, and Honer sells a smaller version in their harmonica kit as well. Um, and the reason that I like to use the scratcher rather than a file, uh, apart from the fact that you know there's there's worry about about uh, 
taking too much off and weakening the reed, which you see isn't really a problem if you're filing properly and nice and flat. You're not going to be uh, damaging the reed really. This is how this is how you can see the scratch marks at the factory. They file in this direction like that. Uh, but the thing about using a file is you're removing a lot more of the surface of the reed and it's the very surface of the reed where your your tensioning develops your sort of your kind of uh, your your work hardening that, that gives the reed its tension and if you're taking that a lot of that layer off then it it takes a, a fair amount of time for the reed to to redevelop that tension and as it redevelops the tension the pitch will go up again so so by using a scratcher like this, um, you, uh, you're limiting the actual amount of the surface of the reed that you're taking off. Um, and uh, in, if, you're, if you need to lower the pitch quite a bit, I might start from about halfway, if you have to work a long way, and just give it a scratch like that. Um, and if it's just fine-tuning after that, you can just start closer up, just a couple of little bits like that. Um, the, uh, uh, for, for filing, I will support the reed with a, a little bit more robust shim, like this is, this is, this is uh, reed material, it's uh, 0.3 millimeters, fairly stiff, and you can hold that under there. And you can you can file with good support like that, but if I'm if I'm if I'm re, uh, lowering the reed, I like to use a shim because like it's thinner and I can get further in without it uh, without it uh, sort of bending the reed up. So there's those now on the high reeds. If you're going to be raising the pitch here, and you want to be really careful about filing like that. Because like I say, you can catch the, the end of the reed. And so rather than use a file there, I'll use a scratcher and I'll scratch in this direction, off this way. You see that? Yeah, just like that. Um, for inside reeds, uh, if the tool, if the scratcher is really sharp, then I find, and, and it's only fine tuning that I'm doing, that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, um, if you're careful with it, and if you have a very low angle, then you can, you can just scratch it like that, you see, that there, right here. Can you see the scratch I put on it? You should be able to see that. Kind of in there, you can kind of see it there, and even with a valved, with a valved uh, reed, you can, you can just lift it up and just set it and keep it nice and low. You can feel feel your way in, and you can lower the pitch that way. Uh, for raising the pitch, there's a couple you need to. You need to, to get raise the tip of the reed out. Um, you can use a, a long, thin shim like this, and and uh, put it in through the harp, through the mouthpiece hole, kind of like this. That's one way you can do it. Um, it's a little awkward sometimes with the chromatic. Especially if it's if it's where the, the slide is it's on the side where the slide is closed. Uh, so there's another another tool that's actually I've incorporated with this valve tool, where the other end you see is that there. All you need to do is set it in like that. this up and then if it's just fine-tuning like that you can actually to 
something like that. Or you can you can use a scraper. Like that. If you're doing it scraping in this direction, you very often will raise a burr on the end. And you need to just kind of clean that burr off so it doesn't hang up on the reed slough. Uh, if you need more support, then once you at this point, you can just slip in a stronger shim like that. And for the inside valves, I mean for a valved slot, you can just raise it up. shadows here. Oops. There you go. And then you can set this under like that. So, two in one, that's your, that's your reed lifter on this side, and then that's your valve tool on that side. Okay, now, um, I want to show you the um, <clears throat> Peterson Ice Strobo Soft Tuner. Let me okay, take this back a bit here and bring this into camera a little. Okay, uh... This is the uh, harmonic tuning app or upgrade. It's an in-app purchase. <clears throat> and what it has here, you can see you've got five bands from F to 5F. And those are the first five partials. Uh, the, the first one, the F, is actually the fundamental. And the... Uh, the 2F, the next one, would be the, the first overtone, and that would be the, the octave. And then the third one would be the octave and a fifth, and then the second octave, and then I forget what that is, the, the, the diminished seventh or something, but, but it's really these, these ones down here that we're most concerned with. Um, and when I'm tuning, I like to... Uh, When I'm getting to to get a nice uh, an octave and a nice sound in the octaves, for the low reeds, what I'll usually do is I will tune it to the second column. That'll be the first overtone, and the low reeds I'll tune to to that, and then in the higher octaves I'll tune to the first bar. What that does that puts the the Overtone, the first overtone of the low reed is the same frequency as the fundamental of an octave higher. And if you get those two in tune rather than the fundamental, then you get a, you get a nicer, nicer blend. Um, but what they do say is that you normally want to tune to the brightest column. Now, now here you see that it's actually the third one there. which would be an octave and a fifth, is actually the loudest. And this is actually the same, if you look at a spectrograph, uh, it's the same thing very often, you know, the spectrograph where you get these, these like uh, little peaks going up and down that, that uh, correspond to the, to the various overtones, that the very often the second and third peak, which would be the... the, uh, the uh, first two overtones will have a higher amplitude, will be louder than actually the fundamental. So so which one you choose, um, you know, you, you kind of look at them all. Oh, and the other thing is with this, when you set it up, you can adjust the sensitivity. Um, the, uh, the way it comes, it can be very sensitive and these bars will be flying up and down, but you can adjust the, the, the sensitivity of it so that it slows it down a little bit and you get a more stable stable view. Now, another cool thing with the uh, this harmonic tuning is when you're playing octaves, when you're tuning the octaves, the, 
the low, the, the, the bar to the left will correspond to the low reed, and the next bar up will correspond to the octave. And you can see where the second bar, the high reed, is actually flat of the low reed. Um, and like I say, this this was this was give it one rough tuning years back. Um, so I'll tune that up, and you can see the difference now. So that's how that works, and it's great. It's great for tuning on even, even, uh, even on an octave harmonica because I play a lot of octave harmonicas. It's a, it's a really handy way to to uh, get your octaves right and tuned. Uh, let me see if we got any questions, comments here. Joel said something increases the response of the reeds, so it makes any instrument equipped with reeds more responsive. Uh, I'm not sure what he... Increases the response of reed. I'm not sure what you were talking about, Joel. Uh, but uh, if you can, you can maybe fill me in on that. Uh, so let's see, what else do we have? Um, oh yeah, there's a lot of things that will affect a reed's pitch um, and the temperature of the of the reed will affect the pitch. Will will make the reed go flat. Um, I know years back I was at a at a harmonica factory in China. We were training the workers and what they were using to tune was an oscilloscope which was really sensitive and they one of the workers called me over and said that uh, asked did I want the reeds tuned to the the signal that the oscilloscope was was producing at the moment of tuning it or a few seconds later because she would she would tune it and it was like with the oscilloscope you had the sine wave moving to the right for sharp and moving to the left for flat and stationary for in tune um, so she would tune it so that the uh, the read the, uh, the, the 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 sine wave would be stable and then maybe two or three seconds later uh, it would go flat and they couldn't figure out what it was but uh, we figured out that it was actually the heat being generated by the file was enough to drop the pitch. Um, so it's it's not something that's going to be a big problem. It's just something to be aware of uh, that when you're when you're tuning to let it cool down a little bit. And as far as the heat goes, uh, one thing that you don't want to do is spend a lot of time tuning one particular reed going up and down because the more time you spend on it. The warmer that reed's going to get, and it's not going to, it's, you know, it's going to, it could be very frustrating. So, so just give it a few, uh, tune it up a little bit, and then leave it. If it's not quite right, leave it and come back to it later. So, uh, that's your temperature. Um, the uh, the resonant frequency of the reed cell also can have a big impact on the on the reed, um, particularly. If the uh, if the resonant frequency of the reed cell is lower than that of the reed, um, that can cause a big problem, especially with uh, smaller reeds. Uh, and normally, uh, on on a ten hole harmonica, uh, the resonant frequency of these holes is higher than most all of the reeds, uh, except for the the highest couple of holes 
for the highest couple of keys, like the key of F, you know, E and F. And you might know, uh, you might, if you play any of these high, high pitched harps, that these, these highest notes can be a little hard to play. Um, and the worst one, of course, was the, uh, the 365, the 14 hole Marine Band in the key of C. No, the key of G was the higher one. And those reeds were so high that it was almost impossible. In fact, the only way you could get them to play, I could, the only way I could get them to play was instead of moving your tongue forward like you'd normally do to, to decrease the, the resonance in your mouth, move it all the way back and let the reed speak with one of the upper partials of the, of the frequencies in your mouth. Um, so uh, that's, that's one thing to consider. And that's why the, like in a few years back, Honer uh, made some changes to the 270 comb, reducing the cell size. And I made some, I made some samples on a 10 hole with adding a little shims inside there to reduce the amount of space inside the hole there and just kind of design it so that none of the reeds were, were in the way of it. It wouldn't get in the way of any of the reeds, but that helped these high reeds to speak a little better by reducing that, that the size of the space in there. Um, other reeds in proximity can affect the pitch as well. And uh, that's it actually, it's, it, it has to do with with the if you have more than one oscillation if you have two or more oscillations that are that are in in proximity to each other in both their strength or as their amplitude their energy and their frequency if the frequency is is close enough that uh, that they will they will start adjusting their frequency slowing Lowering, lowering or raising their pitch to fall into uh, consonants in a, a sort of a, a small integer ratio, a one to one or a one to two or a three to four. And this is found all, all through nature, um, in the, uh, even in the, in the Jupiter's moons uh, have, are in a three to four ratio, some of them with each other, and reeds will do that as well. Um, if, you have, if you have two reeds, say, that are tuned uh, just a couple of cents apart of, from an octave, just a couple of cents off an octave, and you play it very soft, you can hear the beat. If you increase the pressure, you're adding energy to it, and, and they will correct themselves and, and fall into a perfect octave. Same with the third. If you, if you have it tuned, uh, equal tuning is going to be too far away from a pure third, and, and really, no matter how loud you play, that there there'll always be a beat. But if you're just a couple of cents off, you know, like I said, it's usually around 13 cents is a flat of equal temper is is about where a, a pure third is. And if you're if you're 11 or 12 cents flat, you're getting pretty close. And once again, if you play it soft, you can hear the beat. If you increase your volume, then they fall into into a perfect uh, interval as well. Um, oh, another thing is your valves. If you have too much tension on your valves, then that can get in the way of the reed, and it can even cause the reed to buzz. So when you're adding when you're adding tension, either with the valve tool or with initially putting that uh, 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 bend at the back, like I showed you, make sure you not not to do too much because if you do, the reed valve is not going to open up enough to let the reed speak properly and that can cause the reed to play flat um, and it can even cause it to touch it sometimes so so be aware of the the uh, tension on your valves as well um, that's that's just about it is there any questions here uh, what settings do I use in I strobo soft uh, setting let's see you have your your settings here Settings, settings, looking for my settings. There we go. Settings. Um, and uh, they actually have a, 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 they call them sweeteners for different instruments, sweeteners for the harmonica as well, where they give you the, the, uh, the, the temperaments for all of the, all of the models that, uh, 
that Honer was making at the time, the uh, MS, the classic Richter, the harmonic minor, melodic minor, um, and equal temper as well. When uh, I was, uh, when Honer first started using computers to, to get their, uh, for tuning, um, I had to give them settings for all these different upgrades. And, and when Peterson came out with this, they requested some of these. So I sent them, they're, they're based on, based on uh, sweeteners. So I don't, I don't really use it because I, you know, I kind of know where I want to have it tuned. And as, as far as what type of temperament you want, if you want it just or a kind of a compromised tuning or equal temper, that's really up to um, what kind of music you're playing and what, what your taste is, what kind of instruments you're playing along with. Um, I do a lot of playing with my concertina, so I, I, and I, I do flatten the thirds a little bit on, on the concertina, the keys that I play in, so I can, I can get the thirds on the harmonica down to, you know, maybe six or seven cents flat. Um, and, but it's really, uh, it's really what you want. If I've, on, on some harmonicas that I only play solo, where I, where I may play a blues style of tune on it, I might give it a proper just intonation because um, the, the chords sound great and you're not, I'm not gonna be conflicting with other instruments because it would be out of tune. So whatever, whatever type of tuning you want, that's up to yourselves. But this is the harmonic tuning. Um, there's also an extended frequency mode, uh, which is, uh, uh, makes it a little more sensitive to the low pitch, things like that. But it's not, not too much in terms of that. Uh, tuning tools, the upgrades, and then somewhere in there is your, uh, is your sensitivity. Okay, speed, there you go. It's this speed here, adjusting the speed there. That's your sensitivity, all right. And if you find when you're using this, if the things are flying around too fast, you just slow this down a little bit like that. And I have mine, I have mine set, oops, set to about there. You can see that, that's where it's set. Um, you can have the display in, and I have it set to uh, sense, you can have it set to uh, hertz or MIDI, but I keep it to sense. Tuning automatic, or you can have it manual to set whatever, whatever note, but it's pretty good about picking up uh, what note you're playing. Um, so those are the kind of the, uh, and there's noise filters and boost. It's pretty quiet in here, so I don't have to worry about uh, filtering out noise, but there's all that's there. And it's a great app. It's, it's uh, accurate to within one tenth of a cent. And which is, I think that's the only one I know of phone app that's most of the other uh, tuners are only accurate to within a cent, but this is uh, to within a tenth of a cent. And I used, uh, a real strobe tuner, the Peterson strobe tuner for years at Honer, and I find this to be just as good and just as accurate, so I think it's great. Um, any other questions? Let's see. Would I use the same tools for stainless steel reeds? Uh, yeah, these, these, the files and scratchers are, are used um, in accordion or, uh, service for for filing uh, blue steel reeds and uh, they're not quite as tough as stainless steel. Stainless steel has usually has a bit of chromium in it and that's that's kind of a tough material to work with but still it'll it'll definitely work the scratchers and the, the, uh, the files will work with stainless steel reeds. Um, the uh, owner gave up on stainless steel years ago uh, because they found uh, they just didn't they just didn't last. Um, they never used them in the harmonicas, but they used them in the melodicas, and in the accordions, uh, they had what they call as a tropical model accordion that would be for sale in in hot countries, equatorial areas. And normally, uh, accordion reeds are waxed under their reed blocks. Um, and, but for the tropical model, they would they would use silicon to seal it on because the wax can melt and it gets too hot. And once again, they use stainless steel reeds instead of blue steel reeds because they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, 
rust, but I worked on a lot of accords. This was like in the 1950s and 60s that they had the, the tropical models, and I worked on quite a few well-used instruments from that period, both in the regular type with the blue steel reeds and with the stainless steel reeds. And the blue steel reeds on a well-worn accordion, which would have, uh, um, I guess, 144 reeds on the on the right hand for a four voice, uh, you might have maybe one or two reeds broken. With the stainless steel reeds, there'd be 10 or 12 reeds broken. And I think the problem with it is, I suspect, is that Horner may have used the same profile, milled profile, for the stainless steel reeds as for the blue steel reeds. And the stainless steel would be stiffer, I think, and tougher. Um, so uh, less flexible and with the same amount of pressure that uh, it would be easier to exceed the elastic limit of the, of the steel and they would just, they would just break. Uh, if you don't exceed the elastic limit, uh, with blue steel, they will pretty much never, 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 never wear out, never break. I've played concertinas that were 150 years old, and every single reed was still playing great. Um, I know Seidel uses stainless steel reeds, and I think people have different opinions as to how long they last. But uh, first of all, I think Seidel probably got it right in terms of um, giving the reeds the proper flexibility. Um, but once again, if a player plays it too hard, then they will break in no time. And if a player doesn't exceed the elastic limit, you know, by not playing the reed further than it can go, then I think then your stainless steel reeds probably can last maybe forever. So, but the same tools can be used for a stainless steel. Um, uh, EXD is extended under settings. The extended range, yeah, that'd be, that'd be, the extended range would uh, pick up the high frequencies and the low frequencies. And I do have that set for picking that up as well. Um, anything else here? I'm not going to find instructions for the harmonic add-on. Um, if you go to the, the uh, Peterson website, Peterson uh, Tuners website, they, they have a description of the harmonic tuning. But they also say that it's available only for iOS, so it may not be available. I guess it may not be available for Android or other other systems, just for the iPhone and iPad, I guess. Um, but they do, they do, uh, and they they do have show how to use it there, and uh, they describe this I this trick I use of tuning the low reads to the second um, partial and the high reads to the first partial is based on their suggestion for tuning uh, string instruments for the same reason, like on a guitar, you would tune your, your low E to the second partial and tune the high E to the first partial, the fundamental. So um, that's where I got that idea from, from their website. Let's see, uh, do I have a microphone extension? Oh, this, uh, this microphone here is actually one from Peterson that they sell. The specific to, to the to the app, and it it works. Phone works pretty good without it, but it just makes it a, a little bit better, and it, that plugs in like that, just like that. Um, so and it's it's fairly cheap as well. Um, I guess with the new phones, you'll you'll need a, an adapter because they they don't they did away with the eighth inch uh, mini plug. Uh, any other questions here? Um, where's all the comments? I won't see them all. I worked on bass harmonicas. Yes, um, at Honer I worked on bass harmonicas, and those reeds. Uh, there was rarely a broken reed with the bass harmonica because they were just they were so big uh, that they you know they they tend to last. You see, the reeds are quite thick and tough, but also not having the proper flexibility because of the reed design limits. I think. Um, well, the thing about the, as, as my understanding, the, the 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 way to play a bass harmonica is that you 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 don't blow it 
like you would blow a regular harmonica, you actually need to kind of cough into the note, like <coughs> it gives it a, a little, a sharp puff of air to, to get the reed, get the reed playing. Um, I uh, I have a couple of occasions for uh, I was play in for a couple of local productions of Big River, the uh, Broadway play that Roger Miller wrote, and one of the pieces was a uh, involved the bass harmonica. And I think it was Mickey Raphael that told me that what, what he did, because he doesn't usually play the bass, but he just, uh, just he would uh, tape up the holes that he didn't need. Because, <laughs> you know, the bass harmonica is two layers of harmonica, and you got to go back and forth for your sharps and flats. And so that's, you know, good players, you don't need to do that, but, but uh, messers like myself. Uh, that made it a lot easier, but that I do know that was the that's what I was told working at Horner to, to get the reeds to speak properly. You kind of need to kind of give it a slight bit of a cough kind of a thing to get the reed to speak. But other than that, I, I found that, you know they play they play well. Uh, anything else? I don't see all the all the comments, but uh, uh, if anyone's questions hasn't been answered that I missed, maybe you could. Ask him again. Uh, anyway, it's been a pleasure, and uh, if you have any questions later on, you can you can you can you can put them in. And I'll, I'll check from time to time to see is there anything that I can answer them later. Uh, okay, that's all. Thanks again, and uh, take care, everyone, and we'll see you around the bend. Cheers now.